The internet and mass media is a buzz with a phrase launched in a TikTok post. Quiet quitting, whereby employees, in order to protect their mental health, are refusing to go above and beyond in their jobs. With a part of our workforce looking to limit their participation, how can leaders drive the passion and the culture required to make work more meaningful? And that's what we're talking about today on Mark Hain Live. Welcome to this episode of Mark Hain Live. This is where small business owners and entrepreneurs pick up core skill sets to help them create the show-stopping, jaw-dropping experience that customers and employees deserve. I am your host, service expert and master of experiences, Mark Hain. I am so glad that you're here with me today because I have the people engineer, Adam Colazetti, with me today. We will be covering and spotlighting four key components to creating engaging and fulfilling workplace cultures. So stay with us. This is going to be a fantastic show. We've talked a lot on this show about the importance of employee engagement. And what's funny is that during the pandemic, Gallup reported a slight increase in employee engagement with people adjusting to working from home. Now that we have a mixture of hybrid, remote, and in-person jobs, employee engagement has fallen further than it has in the last 10 years. So that brings me to our question of the day. So when you look around your office or your place of business, what indicators do you have that employees are or are not fully engaged in the work that they're doing? I'd love for you to share your experience. Go ahead and share this episode on social media. Hashtag it with experienced leadership. And why don't you put down your experience? What does that look like for you? What does it look like with employee engagement in your workplace? As I mentioned, my guest for this episode is people engineer Adam Colazetti. Adam evolved from the realm of aerospace engineering, working in defense, oil and gas, and construction industries. He is the co-founder of Enta Solutions and the Calgary Chapter Chair for the Global Leaders Organization. Adam, welcome to the show. It's so nice to have you here. Thanks, Mark. I'm super excited to be here. Really appreciate it. Maybe you can start off a little bit and uh, start off by talking a little bit about what you do for your clients. Sure. Uh, Enta Solutions. Uh, Enta means you are, so you are the solution. And we say that we are your corporate culture company. So we animate business culture. So what does that mean? We help companies achieve that mythical ROI that Gallup talks about, where they say engaged people can bring you higher profits, um, less turnover, all those types of things. So that is what we do. That's what we specialize in. We do that in two ways. We see, we say your culture, that's who you are as a company. It's both what you do and what you say. So what you do, it's process development, strategies, how you run your business, more of that classical management consulting stuff. And then uh, what you say is a little more exciting. It's storytelling. It's uh, sharing the stories, the successes that you have. It's workshops, it's team building, uh, it's your internal communications and external. And Right now, the best external tool is social media. So we do a lot of video production, uh, that kind of stuff. And we kind of weave those things together uh, to create that workspace that we all want to be. We all want to be Google, <laughs> right? So yeah. that, that's awesome. Uh, you know, of course, we're hearing a lot of this, you know, new catchphrases in our vernacular now, like the the uh, great resignation, quiet quitting. What do you think is going on in the workplace now? Well, I think what has happened is with the pandemic and people having to move from home and the shift from remote to whatever, I don't think it changed a lot about the work environment. Like, yes, they're remote, but we still like our jobs, we execute, you know, we, we get things done. But I think it caused people to stop and think about themselves and maybe have some internal conversations. And now we're seeing, you know, this, this thing called the great resignation 
where people are saying, wow, why am I doing this? I'm miserable. <laughs> I should go to that. Or I, I regret not trying something new or, or whatever that means. Or maybe they found that, wait a minute, I was actually happier working at home because, you know, it was better for my family or whatever. So I'm seeking out a, a job that will allow me to do that, whatever, whatever that is. I just think it kind of forced us to prioritize ourselves for just a moment. And uh, we're kind of seeing you know, what are people going to do with that? Okay. It's interesting that you say we're prioritizing, uh, prioritizing ourselves because isn't that the, the foundation of this idea of quiet quitting? I mean, this idea of low engagement and people not giving their all mm -hmm. has, it, this is not a new phenomenon. Um, the fact no. that, you know, somebody posted it on TikTok and called it quiet quitting um, is just indicative of a problem. Um, why now, though? Like, why is this this whole is it because we're talking more about mental health in the workplace and and people feel that there's a price to be paid if you want me to commit? Is that what it is? Yeah, well, I think a couple of things are happening. I think there's momentum to narrative. So we're talking about great resignation. We're talking about work. Naturally, engagement comes up. And now this idea of quiet quitting, which is, you know, this is kind of a catchy phrase. What does that mean? Right. And I've been in a few conversations about this and it's a little bit um, polarizing because on the one hand, you get people very adamant and they say, well, companies can't expect us to work, you know, one hour longer than we're paid for. That's not fair. Right. Um, and then the other hand, you know, companies are saying, uh, you know, we, we want you to be engaged. We want you to love here. To, or to love working here. Um, my personal take on it is yes, 100%, right? Your deal with the organization is I, you get paid for 40 hours, I should work 40 hours. Anything beyond that, I choose to volunteer. And I think that is important, right? I choose. So if we leave the over 40 hours aside for a sec, what happens in that 40 hours where you're there? How productive are you? Are you surfing the internet? Are you kind of going for coffee breaks? Are you socializing or right? So this idea of quiet quitting means like I could be super productive and super engaged for, for that 40 hours and just really being awesome. Or what happens is for some reason I emotionally disengage and I start to withdraw into my job description, right? There's a piece of paper somewhere that says, you know, I am an engineer. I shall design this. Da, 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 da. And I'm like, fine, that's all they want. That's what I'm going to do. And then meanwhile, I notice a problem or I have an idea and I say, you know what? Pfft, that's not my job. Someone else's problem. So then you, you have these, everyone's contracting into their job descriptions. And then you get all these spaces in between job descriptions where that's where innovation lives. That's where excellence happens. Uh, and these turn into these big crevasses where companies go to die and they say quiet quitting is not a problem or whatever, but like, look yeah. what's happening. You're, you're, you're fracturing the, the framework of, um, of ideas and how people interact. Right, right, right. So in, in your experience, from what you're seeing, where, where are leaders falling down? Do you think? Well, I think there's a, a few things. I think lots of times leaders aren't set up for success. Um, I think you're promoted into a role or a manager role or a leader role, but it's not like they're like, great, now we'll remove, you know, 20% of your workload so that you can focus on leadership and engaging and all that kind of stuff. It's not how it works. So they're like, still do your regular job, but now here's more responsibility. And by the way, uh, you need to manage the emotional intelligence of your team. So one, I don't think we really set them up for that success. Um, Two, you know, we've all heard of, you know, promoting beyond your, you know, what, what you're good at, right? Yeah. So sometimes we don't pick the right people to be promoted. You know, the best technical engineer maybe just wants to be the best technical engineer, right? Um, talk about rock stars and, and superstars, right? Rock stars are the people in your organization that are like the bricks on the wall. They're going to be the mentors. They love doing, I'll just use engineering as an example because that's my background. They love doing the technical stuff, designing the thing, right? And they're going to be the best at that. And the best thing is that you can do is just not promote them. Just leave them alone. Let them teach everybody, right? And then you got your superstars that are more, I would say, innate leaders. They're like on a rocket path up to the top. You can tell 
And you got to recognize that they'll be at their level in that department for a short period of time, or they'll, you better promote them or they'll look elsewhere. Right. And you treat those people very, very differently, I think. And both are critical to an organization. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And if you don't recognize a superstar quick enough, they will fizzle. Uh, if that's the case, yeah. um, you know, before yeah, you and I can, went, before you and I went live, we talked about this idea that we are promoting people who are really good performers. And, you know, and mm-hmm. I've, I've, we've talked about this, you know, this is episode 116 right now, but in past episodes, we have talked about this idea that we will promote the, the, the superstar performers because, oh my goodness, if, if John can show other people how to weld the way he welds, my goodness, we're going to have such high quality work. It's going to be incredible. And so then we go ahead mm-hmm. and we promote him, but then we don't train him. And the challenge mm-hmm. then becomes we months later, we're shaking our head going, I wonder whatever happened to him. He used to be so good. <laughs> what do you think right. are the biggest handicaps leaders have to face now? Is it just that Ooh. training? Well, I think training is a part of it, right? Really good leadership training. Like for me, I had a pivotal moment in my career when I was put through an emerging leaders program and it just transformed my way of thinking. But I think the key to that is you, you have to be comfortable with yourself and your own you know, emotion before you can be empathetic and be a good leader. You have to be really, really comfortable with who you are and have had somebody push you, right? I think that's the thing with training. You can read a ton of books, you can watch a bunch of videos, but having a good coach or a trainer is gonna like push you into that uncomfortable zone and you gotta live there for a little bit and come out the other side being like, okay, I look in the mirror, I I know a few things about myself now, right? And I think part of the danger of promoting, you know, we talk about these superstars a little bit early, especially when they're young in their career, is they haven't had enough experience to kind of struggle a little bit and go through that stuff so that they can recognize it now and others and offer that empathetic ear. Um, It's, uh, you know, I shared an article with you yesterday from Gallup talking about Mm -hmm. how much this idea of quiet quitting and the great resignation, uh, kind of this whole workplace culture piece is really affecting Mm -hmm. kind of the younger generations now um, that they seem to be taking more of an impetus towards their own mental health and their mo- own well-being, uh, more so than maybe in past generations. Is that something that you're seeing reflected in the workplaces that you're dealing with? I, I think so. Like, I think the younger generation, we, we have access to more information, right? So you're, you're raised, you even like my kids going to school right now, they're they're taking yoga and they're talking about mental health and they're learning about meditation and visit. And so there, there's more of a dialogue. So then they come into the workplace and it's, it's something that they're used to hearing, used to discussing, and they're much more comfortable talking about it. If I look to my parents' generation, right? The baby boomers come in, uh, in, in their experience, it was kind of put your head down and work and get your pension and don't screw that up. Right. Um, so you, you've got these two very different points of view uh, from the leaders that are just exiting at the top end of, you know, retiring and then the, the new generation coming in. Everything from communication, like the technology explosion that's happened, you know, in the last 10, 15 years, the, the way of communicating is different. So you end up with, you know, it, it's like dropping a cultural bomb into a company that's used to running a, way, running a certain way with, with new talent coming in. Uh, no one knows what to do and everyone gets a little bit frustrated. I think right. that's what's happening. Right. And do you, do you think that this has been exacerbated now by the pandemic? Um, how, you know, has the pandemic affected how leaders view their roles now? Is there a difference? You know, I think this is, this is really interesting because when we first went online, and to like, we went out to a bunch of experts and asked them, like people that are experts in strategy, people that were experts in leadership, in HR, and like all the things, right? And we said, now that we're online, like what has changed? What do people need to change? What do they need to do? And the answer almost across the board was like, still do the same things. Now the details have changed, the tools have changed, uh, the human interaction is different and, and, and not the same. So you definitely need to adapt. But I think what, what's happened is it's highlighted 
uh, places where your your systems, your processes, the way you run your business are weak, right? Because you it didn't matter before you you bumped into each other in the water cooler. You could just walk over to the office and stick your head in, kind of unprompted. These kind of haphazard interactions made up for um, weak, weakness in maybe the systems or process. Now all of a sudden we're online, we're not seeing each other, and it becomes very apparent that I have a terrible performance management program because, right, we're not seeing each other and now all of a sudden we're going online and we're trying to do our process and it, we're like, wow, we're not really connecting. It just emphasizes these things. So I think it really made leaders think about, wow, what is happening here? Um, how, how can I do this better or different? And then culturally speaking, I need to pay more attention. If you're in a hybrid workspace or a completely virtual, you now need to manufacture human interaction versus just letting it kind of bump up against each other, right? So now yeah. we've got this a whole new discipline, I think, popping up, which is kind of where, where we live. Okay. Yeah, it's interesting because that you say that, um, you know, the, the whole water cooler and lunch room, I used to call those constructive uh, collisions. It's where you'd bump into mm -hmm. a coworker and go, and he, he, Steve go, oh, what are you working on? And you tell him, he goes, oh, you know, I had an idea, but, and you, you end up having these kind of like micro meetings that, that were hugely kind of uh, creative and d driven by kind of people's thought process in the moment rather than this formal thing. Okay, we're going to do a Zoom meeting. We're going to get together for 45 minutes here's the agenda and everybody sits in the zoom meeting going right unless they're prompted well right? you know and i think it there's a psychological safety piece there right if i run into my boss in the hallway on the way to the meeting and we're walking down the hall and we have a 30 second conversation where he or she is saying hey how was your weekend that sounds amazing you're doing a great job we just created a little piece of human connection and then we go into the meeting, we have our meeting and then I have an idea or maybe I want to disagree with my boss or something. Now, all of a sudden, my psychological safety is a little bit higher and I may say something or present the winning idea. Whereas uh, if I didn't have that little conversation, that little interaction, I might not feel as comfortable doing that. Right. So right. I think. We, we kind of underestimate the cascading effects on human behavior of these little, like you said, these little micro interactions. We, we might talk for five minutes about nothing to do with work, but then we interact better when we are talking about work, right? Very interesting, yeah. You know, I, and, mm -hmm. and so now it's all about, I think, this idea that we now have to kind of design our corporate culture uh, intentionally. And I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into that and we'll get to that right after this. When the spotlight shines on your business, are customers applauding or yawning? In other words, how is your business performing? Make your business a star with a new book, Lights, Camera, Action, Business Operational Excellence Through the Lens of Live Theater by Mark Hain. Mark uses his business and acting experience to help you see your business like a live show so you can create a performance your customers will never forget. Buy Lights, Camera, Action today at your favorite online retailer or directly at markhain.com. I am speaking with culture ninja, Adam Colazetti. Adam... Uh, you know, the more we're getting into this, and of course, uh, you know, I get I get so riled up with this stuff because it's such a passion point for me. But wh why does engagement matter so much? Ooh. Yeah, that's a deep question. Well, I think there there there's a, a lot of ways to answer that, but essentially, engagement means when I show up at work. How energized am I? Am I super excited to be there? Am I creating? Am I being innovative? Or am I kind of executing my job and miserable, right? So, you know, they say the difference, like the opposite of excellence is not like not excellence. The opposite of excellence is pretty good. And we have so many companies and people out there are like, how's your job? It's pretty good. It's pretty good, right? So, you know, that, that secret sauce to jump to amazing, to excellent, to change the world, to, oh my God, I love my job. Um, you know, that, that taps into this uh, imagination, this human potential that is just waiting there to be asked. And that's, that to me, that's engagement. 
I, I want to publish this graphic that you sent me. Um, I think I think that was really kind of instilling uh, this idea of why the engagement well, aspect matters. Um, I thought that you shared this with me and I thought, you know what, I'm going to put the graphic up here because this idea about, you know, the benefits of making sure that people are engaged, it just sounds like it's nothing but win-win for the, for, for the organization. Oh, yeah. Like sometimes when I talk about culture and um, engagement, I, I can see, you know, prospects or clients be kind of just like, okay, like what's in it for me, right? Like what we're, we're trained to think in numbers, especially, you know, if we go to get our MBA or whatever. So like, okay, fine. Imagine if you had 65% more profit in your department or your company. Does that sound interesting? Yeah. Okay. Like, all right, well, let's push that a little further. Like, let's imagine you could push productivity by 15%, right? If you're a manufacturer, you know, and you're making, um, I don't know, a million dollars a year and you add 15% of that, what does that work out to, to your extra um, cash that you could have every month? And then if your attention drops 25% or 21% or whatever it was, well, how much does it take to replace a person? I mean, a, a highly technical trained person, I mean, minimum $150,000 and up, right? So, you know, if you could reduce turnover by 20%, just think of that, that savings, it's crazy. So, um, you know, for my own business, we have to turn towards these real numbers and say, imagine what you could do with that. You know, if there was a program that said, never mind 65, what if just 15% increase in profit with the team that you have would that be interesting to you right and of course you're going to say yes it's it's almost right? like we now need to make um employee engagement and retention part of our business planning um like mm -hmm. it really has to be this designing aspect to it oh yeah like i ask so um i often ask people like what you know, same question you asked me, what does engagement mean to you? And everyone has a slightly different answer. And then like, well, what, what obstacles do you see? And the common answers are, uh, you know, like stuck in the whirlwind. I can never work on the business. I'm always in the business. Or we, you know, we, we do a workshop or we do a seminar, but then we just go right back to the way we were doing things before. And we can't just like get unstuck or things like that. And then the last question is like, hey, listen, I think everyone agrees. Like, I think everyone acknowledges that Gallup or Forbes or any of these organizations are, are legitimate, reputable sources. So we all agree that it's possible. The numbers are there. So like, what's your plan going forward this year, right? A strategy meeting, all right, we want projections up by 20%, up by 30%. But you're right, where's the engagement piece that says, hey, let's get 65 by taking care of the people. Yes. And 100%. That's where I start to say, like, culture engagement, it's a discipline the same as any others. And you better, you should pay attention to it. And, sure. and you have you have a few keys to creating high engaged workplaces. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to start off with um, kind of this concept first. Um, I think in the list that you provided me, uh, psychological safety was the very first key that you brought forward. Can we talk a little bit about what that might look like in, a, in an organization? Sure. I mean, psychological safety is this idea that you feel comfortable where you are, right? On the, on the lower end of the scale, it's, oh, I feel like an outsider. I don't feel like part of the team. I sit in the back of the room. I, I'm not really comfortable saying anything, you know, and then gradually you're into a phase of, oh, I feel, I feel part of the team. I'm still pretty quiet, but I feel welcome. And then it's like, oh, okay, I feel comfortable asking questions, I, right? I can speak up. Blah, 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 blah. And then all the way when you get to like the higher end of it, it's like, I feel comfortable challenging the CEO when I don't, when I disagree. It doesn't matter my role, right? And the CEO will be like super excited that someone challenged them, their way of thinking because then we can work through it, right? You know, if, if you read like five different functions of a team, right? Patrick Lencioni is, is a common one that people like, right? They talk about the best teams, the most high performing teams, almost looks like they're arguing, right? They're not, they're hammering it out. They're, they're taking an idea and beating it to death and, and making sure it's the best uh, idea of everything. And that's this idea of psychological safety that, that I, come, I come to work and I feel valued, I feel heard, um, I, I, I'm okay being vulnerable, right? And I think 
we talked before about leaders, like what their biggest obstacle is, it's being vulnerable. It's standing in front of your team saying, guys, I don't know, or I screwed up, or please help. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's and you see this and we've seen this, I think, in different in different realms uh, where people came up, uh, you know, a lot of times happens in crisis. Uh, where mm. where something happens and um, you know you had a leader like the the definition of that leadership came in under under a microscope because of the how the crisis evolved and and we mm. see that you know oh if I was to do this again I would I would have trusted my staff more <laughs> right or or yeah. something along yeah. those lines right totally and I think that the tricky part about psychological safety is. Like I said, pretty good is the opposite of excellence. As long if the company is successful, the industry's, you know, the economy's high, everyone's, you know, their jobs aren't in danger. Fine, whatever, right? Yeah. It's not an evident problem. But what we had happen in, in Calgary is, you know, it's cyclical. So the price of oil drops, yeah. people start getting laid off, and all of a sudden you realize that you have this house of cards when it comes to trust and the psychological safety. And now all of a sudden people are muttering in corners and their rumors are starting. And it's just, it's just an awful environment because that whole backbone just didn't exist. It's a hundred percent. It's like how you behave in crisis that really defines who you are. Right? So fascinating. And, and yet it's, it's like, there's nothing that is awkward about that, that perception. Uh, the, you know, I, I'm a baby boomer, so I'm one of those ones that you talked about, you know, my parents, um, you know, the, the big thing with when I got into the workforce was I could not let my parents down. I had to make sure I was a great employee because if not, you know, I would shame my family name. <laughs> And yeah. so this this yeah. idea of, of psychological safety, right, for at the time was the only way you were psychologically safe in my work environments was when the boss said jump, you didn't ask why, you asked how high. Um, nowadays, exactly. this well, idea of, yeah. yeah, exactly. And so now this this idea that, you know, employees can push back and question things opens up this mm -hmm. whole idea that every day is like a brainstorming session where you get to see decisions through different eyes and be able to to gauge it and be open to that and yet i still see that in a lot of organizations this idea of psychological safety is actually doesn't exist it's it's um you know it's still my company do as i say not as i do right and mm -hmm. uh, and then we end up with this huge conflict to your point well you know i've heard lots of times people have left a company they've been for for a long time Maybe they even took a pay cut to go to a, this new place. And they're like, oh, my God, I, I had an idea and my boss got excited about it. And now we're actually doing it. I'm like shocked and I'm actually a little bit uncomfortable that that happened. <laughs> right? I'm just not used to it. Right. I'm used to kind of just like walking the line. I show up to the meeting. You know, I zone in and out for an hour. I'll speak when I'm my turn and then I'm done. Right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, how wasteful. Like I said, there's it's like this. Imagine this cloud of human potential just like floating around and nobody's tapping into it. I, I, I was blessed with uh, being able to work on contracts where I had to design uh, food service operations. So like bars, restaurants, mm -hmm. uh, within casinos and hotels and that sort of thing. And um, I had a head bartender um, who was working. He was part of the team before I even got there. And we had to start drafting out the, uh, the designs for the bar. And so I pulled him mm -hmm. aside and I said, you know, I, you're a bartender. Um, let's design this bar together. And he was absolutely floored that I would ask him. It's like, why are you asking me? I'm not a designer. It's like, but you work it every single day. You know where your handicaps are. You know where your, where, where your obstacles are in performing your duties. I said, I want your help to help design past those. And he was thrilled, <laughs> absolutely yeah. thrilled that somebody would ask him. Oh my God, how many people are out there just like waiting to be asked? Yeah. I, I had a similar experience in construction. I moved from oil and gas over into construction of high rises. So I was probably the least technically knowledgeable person, although I was in a senior position because of my management experience. So we had an issue where the, the framer and the electrician disagreed on like what should happen and how it should be done. So I went on site and, uh, you know, in, in construction, it's historically been like the, the loudest person kind of wins, right? Whoever's yelling the loudest and that's, 
you know, just kind of what happens on site because it's, it's really intense. But I walked in there and I was like, guys, I have no idea what you're talking about. So I really need your help to just teach me about what you're even talking about so we can find a solution. And you could just see in their faces, they were like, oh, <laughs> okay, right? And, you know, my boss asked me later, he's like, do you run into trouble? I know that technically you're not as experienced. I was like, honestly, it's the best thing because I walk in there and I'm just tell everyone that I'm the most useless person here. Teach and me how I, to do it. And it I bet you any money that the, getting the electrician and the drywaller together or the framer together um, at the same mm -hmm. time to, to, to clarify what their roles are actually created clarity between the two of them so that they could see each other's point a lot better as well. Oh, yeah. And now they have a religion. Now they have each other's numbers. Yeah. Instead of calling me and complaining, they text each other and they figure it out. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so, Amazing. I, it just the, the like you know the cascading effects are so vast. It's yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. And and you know to and this idea as well is the the idea of being able to fail forward, creating a safe psychological safety that if people fail, it's not going to be the end of the world. Because I think that's mm -hmm. one of the hardest things that people have in their businesses is to take a chance to innovate. And and not be not be then pointed at and blamed for the outcome. Sure, and it, it yeah. flows up the line, right? If I'm a mid-level manager, and part of my job as leader is to recognize those opportunities where I might know a little bit better or think slightly different, but yep. my team member is like adamant that they want to try it and they want to do it, and I'm like, okay, go for it, right? Yeah. Um, if I don't feel safe. Kind of letting them have that space to fail because my boss gives me space to fail do you know what i mean like it, it yeah. goes all the way from the top it doesn't matter how big your organization is um the the vps will behave like the ceo and then the middle manager will behave like blah 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 blah, blah right so so aside from this psychological safety piece what other keys do you think are integral in designing corporate cultures that that create striving workplaces well, I, I, you know, we say step one, define your culture, work on that safety piece, do a team building. We always try and kick off with like, you know, a bit of a team building workshop, but like now build something together. We can't all sit around the fire and sing, you know, and, you know, play guitar all, all day. If we're not actively building something, we're not enriching that relationship back and forth. And in this case, it's building the business. So this is like ideas, innovation. This is where like this lives. This is where companies can have innovation strategies on like how to foster this, you know, have uh, dragon's den competitions, crazy stuff, right? I've, I've seen companies do crazy fun things with this. Um, but yeah, you need to be actively building together. And by doing that, you're going to see really quickly who we, we call them champions, right? It's people in the organization, the influencers, the ones that step up, like I have an idea. It's not in my job description, but you know what? I will handle that project or I will lead that committee or whatever, right? I will organize the event. It's these people that start to pop up. So it's just, you're like your early adopters. The funny thing is um, culture propagation, this kind of engagement propagation looks very similar to, you know, like a sales and marketing curve where you've got your early adopter, your marketing improvement internally, right? <laughs> So your early adopters pop up and you need to know who those people are because those are the people who are going to sell it to everybody else, not you as, as the leader, because it's way more powerful coming from, from them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, so. and again, to, to, yeah. Uh, what about, what about this idea of the um, striving for constant incremental improvement? How does that fit in to um, kind of these keys? Well, it's Kaizen, right? That's the Japanese yeah. concept of, of improvement. And that's, right. it's, it's, it's a mindset and it's, it's not limited to just the organization, right? The people that are going to love being an organization that loves to improve are the people that like to improve themselves. So those are the people that love to do training. They love to try out new sports, they new instruments, whatever, right? They're just, they're constantly working on themselves and that all overflows out into the, the environment that they're in, whatever it is, and in this case, business. And like, like you said, if you, if you set an improvement goal that seems way too big, like we want to overhaul the whole factory, you, you know, and even if the timeline's big in the next five years, you can't grasp it. It's not a vision that you can like grasp hold of and like relate to. So have that vision, but then like, let's break it down into something that we can change today, 
Today we're working on, I don't know, something small, right? Like a little process a report. Let's, why don't we create a template? There's an easy one, right? Like, so it's something that people can, can do and it's a success that you can celebrate. And this kind of leads to the next part, right? Is that storytelling piece. You can't just wait till the end big game to celebrate. You have to celebrate along the way and the people that do it. So like, hey, look at look at Mark. He um, totally reorganized the kitchen, even right? Something to, or like sourced better coffee for the people. Like little low hanging fruits that you celebrate and you share those stories around, and people are like, oh wow. People are getting recognized for like stepping up. I have an idea. Like, you know, it gives permission for innovation, doesn't it? Yeah, totally. And you can kind of see how it starts to flow now, right? We all feel safe. We're building together. Now we're sharing stories. So this works especially well if maybe you've got multiple buildings or offices, right? And you want it to like take on across multiple buildings or multiple floors or departments or whatever, um, where you're just sharing these stories back and forth. Newsletters work great, uh, posters on the wall. The key with internal sharing is that it's multiple messages and like 10 times more than you think, right? Yeah. So <laughs> it's not just one, right? one memo. Yeah, exactly. Right. Like if you haven't, I, I read somewhere the other day and I, I can't remember the book I was reading, but it, it said, um, as, as a, as a leader, if you aren't absolutely sick of your message and you haven't communicated it enough, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was like, that's a really good guideline. I'm going to use that. Like if I have just like, how many times do I have to say it? But there you uh, go. yeah, there you go. 10 this times is, in fascinating ways. You know? This is so fascinating, Adam. Um, for those people who are watching thinking, wow, this is, we're onto something here. How can people get a hold of you? Uh, best way to get a hold of me, you can head to our web website, Enta Solutions, E N T A Solutions.org. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. There's my name right there. There's not a lot of call as Eddie, so I will pop up. And that's it's probably the quickest, fastest way, I would think. Terrific. Great. Um, you know, I, I started this episode talking about how people are choosing to roll back their involvement. Um, I read a um, uh, article in BNB Bloomberg talking about quiet. Uh, not quiet quitting. They mentioned quiet quitting, but now they're talking about quiet firing. Um, the practice essentially of constructive dismissal where you they're creating environments where, where people want to quit. Um, mm -hmm. Leadership accountabilities. I mean, obviously that is just the wrong way to go in every facet for every reason. Um, mm -hmm. How important as, a, as one of these cultural defining keys is accountability? Well, I, it's, it's the fourth piece of the puzzle, right? You can, you can tell the stories internally, externally. We talk about sharing it on social media and brand ambassadors, but if I don't know what I'm accountable for and there's not that feedback, uh, a high performing team can't function if we're not accountable for each other, right? If I say, I'm going to do something, you need to trust that that will happen or I'll be given a reason why with, with due time or, or whatever. So, you know, we, we talk about work charts, you know, the typical organizational chart, especially for a smaller business, there's like the boss and then there's kind of like everybody else. And there might be six or seven boxes on the page or 10 or whatever. But if we plot out, plot out accountabilities, we essentially map out all the pieces and processes of your entire business into like a big picture. And then we look at it and we assign names to it colors and you can look at it and you're like holy smokes i'm wearing that many hats no wonder i can't work on my business right so it gives you some insight into the whirlwind a little bit or like wow mark is in everything like we can't have him be in everything <laughs> let's put let's pick the ones that he's great at and let's put him there right um and then let's find someone who's great at the other things so it, it's it's absolutely the piece because the the improvement will fall down if the accountability is not clear, um, the communication, that, that feedback, that psychological safety, if we don't have that, we, we can't hold each other accountable in a respectful way. So you, you've, you've 100% nailed it. That's like kind of the fourth piece of the puzzle to bring it all, all together. 
Right, right. And you did allude a little bit to the communication piece, but I'd like to dig a little bit deeper into the value and the importance of communication when designing our culture. And we'll get to that mm. right after this. When you're delivering an important speech to a huge audience, it's easy to lose your place or go way over time. Give yourself an advantage with the Pro Speaker Presentation Speech Timer app. No more checking your watch or calling for time. The Pro Speaker Presentation Speech Timer app keeps you on track with easy to see timers, even changing color for visual prompts during your speech. And you can set audio cues to practice or set it to vibrate so you don't even have to look. Be the pro you know you are. Download the app at speakerpresentationtimer.com. Welcome back. I hope you are getting tons of value from today's episode. As you can tell, Adam and I are passionate about the topic today. Um, if you belong to an organization that could use our help, or you might be planning a leadership conference or a leadership retreat, and you could use somebody to come and speak to your team, we'd love to explore how we could be of service to you and your people. So feel free to reach out. Um, Adam, we talked about all these different things. This one aspect, I really wanted to keep communication to the very end because I know that when you don't have good communication, everything else just goes to pot, goes to hell in a handbasket. Uh, so <laughs> let, let's talk a little bit about the role of communication when it comes down to designing our corporate culture. Well, I think right away when we talk communication, I always think of that, that, that quote that says the, the biggest myth in communication is the fact that it happened, right? <laughs> so uh, you got to keep that in mind. And we talked a little bit about hybrid or remote workforces where now communication is a little tougher. So communicating all the way from the top, the, the vision, a vision that people can understand and grasp hold of. What is it? Where are we going? Do we want to be the number one? retailer in, in Canada? Do we want to, uh, I don't know, raise this much money? Do we want to, what is it? And, and in a time frame that people can wrap their heads around, right? Um, and then communication amongst team members, right? This is the day to day. I do this, I do that. Um, but I think the trickiest part about communication is that different people communicate differently, right? We talked about kind of the, the different generations Younger people now communicate a lot more like through apps or things like Slack or video or TikTok or, or whatever. So, I, you know, I hear a lot of frustration. People say, man, the new guy came in and why doesn't he just pick up the phone? Right. So I think understanding that there are different venues of communication, but also understanding that the people on the other end, how they like to be communicated to is important. And we don't always think about that. Right. It's almost like when it comes down to communication, especially internal communication, you need some sort of a DEF CON process, you know, that you have, <laughs> if you have something super, super critical, this is how you're going to best communicate. If it's just something casual, something not so important, just, you just, right, you, that you have different mediums to be able to communicate. Yeah. And I think this is where language also becomes important, right? I mean, if everything's a crisis, nothing's a crisis. Right. So you right. have to be able to say when it truly is, you know, high priority, when I put that explanation mark on my email, you know, it's a big deal. Right. And everyone has their own little style of doing that. But 100 percent, lots of lots of companies have like kind of code red, code blue, code green, whatever, whatever it is. Um, escalation is another thing. Like when is it very clear? Where is my box and when do I need to escalate it to my boss? Uh, and when does that happen? Like, what does he not or she not need to know? When do I need to escalate it? Right? Yeah. If that's not clear, then we can't trust up and down and sideways and all those those other great things. Right? Where it's kind of ironic. We're in this age. We have more communication channels than we could possibly imagine. I mean, I, there's probably five apps I could use to get a hold of my team right now, and yet we're communicating less. Which, to your point at the very beginning about engagement dropping. Um, right now. So yeah. what the yeah. heck? And there, there's, I mean, there's all sorts of tools that we can do for communication to be able to um, create 
uh, operating procedures so that we know where resources are located. I, I did one episode with, with a lady who was talking about, you know, do, you know, have these resource kind of lists that people know that they can go to. And, and when we do the onboarding or what I like to call forever boarding, uh, because I don't think the onboarding process should ever end, um, we, we make absolutely sure that we, um, that we train through where resources are found so that people aren't knocking on the door just to say, um, where do I find the pens? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. We call that the, the whole business. So we say that uh, if a self-actualized individual that we're all striving to be can have a well-balanced mind, body, and soul, whatever that means to them. Yeah. Organizations and businesses are just bunches of people. doesn't matter how many. So a natural analogy emerges, process, tools, and your culture. And where they all meet in the middle and they all are kind of work together, that's your, that's your sweet spot. So if to your point, technology is a great example. If I drop in a new app or something, uh, will people use it? Okay, I'll let me write a procedure on how to use it. But here's the tricky thing about procedures. Did I write it in a way that speaks to the culture and values of the people working here? Which is why we always say, start with defining your culture. What are your values? Let's define them. If you already have them defined, then let's test them, right? So when I write a procedure, if if you picked creativity, accountability, and, you know, I don't know, innovation or something, then let's make sure that language is in there and people, when they read it, be like, okay, this is the innovative part. If I have an idea, then this is what I need to do. Here's the creative part, right? Here's the accountable part. So that language is like everywhere. You don't want to say, oh, we're an entrepreneurial company. We love kind of flexibility. And then write a 20 page step-by-step -step prescriptive procedure. Right. It won't fit. People won't, they'll reject it, right? It'll be a waste of effort. So, I, I like um, that you use the, the phrase test your values because you, mm -hmm. usually the way that values get tested in an organization is during crisis. That's where you, you figure mm -hmm. out people stepped up and lived the value or they didn't. Is there a more productive way to test values? Well, what we do in our, our workshops, we're like, all right, you picked these three or four values, right? You're like, yes, this is, these are the ones we want. Maybe you did it through the workshop. Maybe you had it on the wall already. We're like, great. Tell me a story where adaptability, which you just chose as your value, was the key factor to either your success or not success. And we like put people in groups and like, okay, come back, tell us a story. So it's story time. Tell us a story about something good or bad that happened where adaptability was the key factor. And if those are your values, you should have no trouble listing off five, six, like tons of stories. I'm like, okay, awesome. That's kind of their stress test for it. If you're struggling a little bit with it, like, all right, let's explore that, right? Maybe that isn't the right word. The cool thing is though, you go through that and you get this list of stories, boom, you walk over to your marketing or internal communications department, like, hey, here is your social media content for the next three months and internal newsletter and blah, 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 right? We just proved that our values are good and we want to tell those stories with both internally and externally, right? So, so good. So good. Yeah. <laughs> is, like, you know, I, I'm, I'm, you know, to your point, I, about this internal communication thing, I think every business now needs to have a little video room, you know, almost like the way reality TV shows have those profile rooms, you know, that they get to sit in front of a camera and, and do things. And mm -hmm. then you could pose questions and then they could sit in front and then tell stories. And then those stories can become, um, either points of concern depending on what's being said or points of bragging and being able to kind of wave your flag of success. I've seen, um, the larger the company, the, the more it starts to make more sense, but like an internal podcast just for your company. And this is where like, it. maybe it's the CEO or some, somebody high up invites people from the company on the show and they talk about what's going on and what's going on with you. What are your ideas? Blah, 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 blah. And it's like a weekly, podcast that they do as a part of their job and imagine the power of that imagine if you showed up at a company maybe it's huge maybe there's fifty thousand people and you're listening to a podcast from someone maybe over in europe who's got an, an idea and you that would be perfect for you so now you're going to go reach out and chat with them and you know you're, you're creating this environment where yeah holy crap like we just love to share ideas you know 
I can imagine that some people might be um, tuning into this podcast and thinking, this is really great. I, I have to do something to my, to my culture and so on. Um, what are some of the cautionaries when people are moving forward with kind of wanting to design kind of a new way to do things, a new culture, a way to, to create levels of engagement and so on? What are some of the cautionaries they should be aware of? Uh, the, a couple of things. So, so biggest one is if the leadership isn't hundred percent committed, like if, so, if, you know, if there, there's even one very influential person who's kind of like half in half out, it, it will derail the whole effort. You have a huge opportunity to gain trust, but then you also have a huge opportunity to lose that really fast. So if you get in front of your team and you do like a workshop where there's a lot of empathy and storytelling, like people cry. Uh, it gets really intense, but you end up coming over there like super connected and super believing in, you know, this future and this thing that's greater than yourself. And then you turn around and let the whirlwind back in and you don't do what you said you were going to do. You will lose trust like crazy. and It will be so hard to get it back. So if, if you're ready to embark on this journey, you need to be in a hundred percent. You have to be committed. And recognize that just doing a workshop or just writing a process is not enough. You need an engine to drive it for a period of time. And for, I think it's about six months. You need an engine to drive it. And that could be a consultant like you or I, that could be a coach, that could be someone internal, but someone's got to put a ton of energy into pushing it, but it will reach a point where it becomes uh, the self propagating machine where now it's just the way you do it and engagement actually pulls the organization up on its own. But to start, you need an engine. And if, if you start thinking that, oh, I, I'll just spend a few thousand bucks and I'll, you know, do a workshop or whatever, you be very careful because you're, you're playing with people's emotions and psychology here. It's not just, um, you know, writing a process or something. So. I love that throughout this episode, you've mentioned trust many times. Mm -hmm. And to, to your point, this idea of, you know, putting a Band-Aid on something or doing something because now it's the, it's the uh, process of the week or process of the month. And we're going to focus on this. Um, we're going to, those, those actually hurt more than they help. And um, so this mm -hmm. idea of building trust, how can leaders test if a value of trust is in place? Ooh, interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think I, I always trust... give you little questions, by the way, Adam. Always little <laughs> questions. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, I think trust in particular lends itself to vulnerability and this idea of psychological safety. So if I talk to leaders and they want to, maybe their business, it's chaotic. They're, they know that it's, it's not good. Um, you say, okay. Would you be willing to get up in front of your entire team and admit that you did a shit job the last year in, in this and that you need help and you want to improve? Would you be willing to say that? And if the answer is no, then that's tricky because now you don't trust your team enough to say that. So how are you expecting them to trust you? So uh, trust involves, I think, Every time we put ourselves out there and be vulnerable and ask for someone's trust, we're putting ourselves a little bit at risk, right? Yeah. You invited me on the show to talk live, trusting that I wouldn't get on here and say something terrible or, you know, polarizing or, or something that just would not fly, right? Um, I think I think it's the same thing there. So you, I think the the stress test is like, well, what would you be willing to do first? And this and you're right on that mark, right? I, I love that idea of you know testing it and then you know being able then to go back and say if not, why not? Uh, why why can't you be that vulnerable? As we wrap up, do you have any last thoughts about this idea of building this engaging workplace culture? I guess my last thoughts on it would be to. Just be open to the idea. I mean, sky's the limit in creativity. If, if you're doing business improvement and, and all this kind of stuff, with that strategy, pair team building with it once a month. But not just any team building. We don't just go have a barbecue. We build something 
that specifically emphasizes a point. So for example, if, if we're building quality programs, we do a team building session where it's like blocks and building with different teams, but it's specifically designed to prove a point about quality or this. If we're, if we're going to play Dungeons and Dragons as a team building, we're going to design a scenario that speaks to your, your team. So um, I think at, at the end of the day, marry your process improvement with the team building piece, that psychological safety thing, and then tell those stories, both internally, externally, and then lastly, of course, accountability. Really take time to, to kind of map that out. So um, that's it. That's that's all you got to do, right? <laughs> that's that's all. Simple, need. simple. Just do it. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Adam, this has yeah. been absolutely fabulous. Could you just remind everybody one more time how they can get a hold of you? Sure. You can head up, check out my website. It's entasolutions.org. And uh, you can find me on LinkedIn, Adam Colazetti, K-O-L-O-Z-E-T-T-I. There's not a lot of Colazettis out there. That's probably the easiest way than spelling out my email and you trying to remember it. So yeah, find me there, reach out. I'm always happy to chat. I would gladly meet with you and just brainstorm anytime. I am a huge believer in just giving. We're all in here together to make better businesses that can change the world. So that's, that's why we do this. Love it. Adam, thank you again. I really appreciate you being here, sharing your knowledge, your passion, and your expertise. You have given us so much to think about. So thank you so much for doing this with us today. Thanks for having me, Mark. Really appreciate it. If you have any questions about today's episode or would like a complimentary 30-minute brainstorming session with you and your team, feel free to book yourself on my online calendar. The link is down below. It's the one that is written with meetwith.markhain.com. As always, I am at your service. And if you haven't done so yet, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to this feed and follow me on social media. We have tons of content out there as well. My name is Mark Hain. I hope you stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope you dare to be the exception.